Thursday. Hello. I hope that you are all having just the most wonderful day ever. Um, so tonight on the agenda, I have like a ton of questions to answer from you guys. I'm very excited to see how many of you guys are writing in your questions. I'm trying to turn on my other light here um, because the more questions I get, then the more I know that you guys are learning and working at your riding. Spring is coming. The days are getting longer. Show season is here. So it's all very exciting. Um, tonight's Q&A is sponsored by um, for those of you guys that don't know what Patreon is, Patreon is kind of like a tip jar where people go and they dollars or ten dollars a month or just whatever you feel like is fair um, for all the free content that I put out there. And on Patreon, I also post like a lot of behind the scenes stuff. Like I posted some of the videos from the horse show. I post some of like the training lessons that I have with my private horses. Um, and then some of the benefits on Patreon too, is that I'm going to be answering your questions first, always on these Q&A sessions. So if you haven't yet, be sure to check out the link is below. It's um, patreon.com forward slash Amelia Newcomb Dressage. On the agenda tonight, I wanted to talk a little bit about my horse show last weekend, which was super fun. Hi, Linda and hi, Olympia on YouTube. I was going to talk about my horse show. I was going to answer your questions. And yeah, I think that's it. So um, last weekend, I went to the horse show. I took five horses. It was like so crazy busy. Um, on the first morning, I literally had a ride like every hour. So I'm really grateful to my mother, Joellen, who came to my client, Casey Cannon, and Sylvia and Karen. Everyone who came and helped out to, you know, just get everything done was amazing. One thing that I really love about horse shows is that you learn so much and you always like one of my clients said, when you go to the horse show, it's kind of like you regress in your training about six months. So, and that's so true. It's like you go to the horse show and you feel like a lot of what you had at home falls apart. But that's also why it's like so good to go to horse shows is because you leave the show so inspired about how much better everything has to get at home. So I really learned a lot from the horse show. My horses were all good, but there's always a lot of room for improvement. And as far as like just my riding as well, like I feel like at home, you know, I keep my body and my mind a little bit more organized. And sometimes when I go to the horse show, I start to like ride a little bit frantically and get a little sloppy. So that's one thing that I really want to focus on this season with my horses is really that I get to the point where I'm riding more in the horse show like I am at home. And part of that comes from like, for example, when you move up a level, like with my young horse, Kensington, Last year, we did third level. And then at this show, I did one fourth level test. And then I did the FEI seven-year-old test. The seven-year-old test is really hard. It's kind of like a mini pre-St. George. And so he's kind of green for that level. And because of that, I was like, you know, I kind of had to like get it done in a way that maybe wasn't um, as perfect as it should have been. So anyways, I learned a lot from the horse show. I think that my horses all got a lot better, but then I also go home and I'm really clear about the homework that I have to do. Um, it was also really cool at the horse show. I met some of you guys. I had one woman come up to me and she was like, Amelia, I was going to quit dressage. Like I was going to stop riding until I watched your videos. And that like, it like gives me chills. It's so cool to hear that from you guys and to hear that like my videos and my content have touched you when I don't even know you guys. And um, 
it really is inspiring to think that like us as a community through the education, through the community that we're changing the sport and we're inspiring people and encouraging people. And um, that's really my mission is this idea of dressage for all and helping to spread like correct and good education. I have had like some of the best trainers in the world and the best teachers in the world. And I'm so grateful to all of them. Um, and so I hope that I can share some of that knowledge and some of that inspiration with all of you guys. So let's see, who do we have here tonight? Hi, Lori and Tracy and Cindy. Um, where's Levi? Levi is sitting. Oh, he's on the floor. So you guys can't see him. Levi's down there. Levi is my dog. He's like, seriously, the best dog ever. Um, so I wanted to start out with our questions from Patreon. We have a few new members on Patreon. So we have Blaze, Jennifer Brownrig, Marlene, Sarah Hicks, Barbara and Eileen. So be sure to check us out on Patreon and hopefully you can join us. I post again, it's like kind of the Amelia's fangirl site. So there's some videos from the horse show, some of my training videos. I posted the video of Kensington doing the seven-year-old test on Patreon. So be sure to check that out. Thank you to all of you guys that are already on Patreon. So the first question is from Wendy on Patreon. Hi, Amelia. I have a hard time with keeping contact on my outside rain. Are there any exercises that could help with that? So yes. And basically, how do you get contact in your outside rain? The way that you get contact in your outside rain is by pushing your horse off of your inside leg. So it's actually kind of like, this feeling like you're shoving your entire horse's body over into the outside rein. That's how you get contact on the outside rein is by moving your horse off of the inside leg and into the outside rein. Some of the best exercises to get contact on the outside rein are leg yield, turn on the forehand, um, serpentines, spiral in, one of my favorites is like spiraling in and leg yielding out. I think that that is a really good exercise. And yeah, let me know you guys watching in the chat if I'm if I'm missing any good exercises. But pretty much the secret to dressage is inside leg to outside rein. That is the secret to dressage. So there you go. Uh, next question is from Instagram. How do you look for potential or trainability in horses? Um, that's a really good question. So I think the biggest thing when looking at a horse for potential is their temperament. And how do you tell their temperament? I think a lot of it comes from riding them and asking the horse questions asking things maybe a little bit differently than their rider or trainer does and seeing how the horse responds. Because if you have a horse with a good temperament, then they're going to be much easier to train. Um, if possible, I like to see horses that have gone to a few shows. I really pay attention when I'm riding the horse to their focus and their attention so like if the horse is really like distracted and looking around and trying to leave the arena, then that tells me that they're not that interested in me, not that interested in work. And I don't like that. I also pay attention to how the horse is on the ground. So like when they are very like sweet and kind and respectful on the ground, then that's really important to me. And then, of course, a big thing is confirmation and the natural gait. So you want the horse to have a good walk, a good trot, a good canter. It doesn't have to be like these crazy gaits, but they need to be good. And then the confirmation, like the horse has to have straight legs and good feet. That's like one of the most important things, because if the legs are all crooked and wonky, and if the horse doesn't have good feet, then it's not going to... Um, 
it's not going to stay sound. It's not going to live up to its potential. Okay, next question. What do you recommend as a training program for horses with kissing spine? So I think the best thing, if you have a horse with really any kind of injury or anything, is just correct training. And um, when horses have kissing spine, it's basically like their vertebrae and their back are touching. It can be really painful and uncomfortable for them. But the best thing to do is to make the horse round and make them use their back and use their top line. Because if you let them go around all like hollow and stiff, that's going to make the kissing spine worse. But when you can get the horse to use their core, use their abs, that's going to make their back feel better. It's just like us. Like if you have back problems, you should strengthen your core. So the same thing with your horses. Okay, next question. How do you sync with your horse's rhythm? Uh, one of my favorite things to do when I'm riding is count. Like, <laughs> this sounds really dumb, but I'll just sit there and I'll count the walk. Like, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Or I'll count the trot. Like, one, two, one, two. Uh, you can also listen to music, but it is really important. Rhythm is the base of the training scale. So you want to feel that rhythm. And then everything that you do with your horse has to be within the rhythm of the gate. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, let me know where you guys are watching in the chat. Let's see. We have Edward is from Rancho Cucamonga. Kathy is from Redland. Cindy is here from Temecula. Kareen is from Florida. One thing that is so cool about our audience here is that we have like an international audience. And I've been doing office hours every week with people that are taking the training scale masterclass. And it's so cool. We have people from Israel. We have people from Australia. We have people from South America. Like it's so cool. Okay. There's Levi over there for everyone who was wondering where he was. All right. Um, Christine is from Canada. Lori's from Woodland. Donna's from Canada, Arkansas, Minnesota. Cool. I hope that you guys are all enjoying the longer days, warmer weather. Show season is coming up. I am doing a webinar on show season that is going to be May 1st. So be sure to mark your calendars Sunday, May 1st, 12 noon Pacific time. I'm going to be doing a free webinar to help you guys out with show season. Oh, there we go. New Zealand. Hi in New Zealand. Okay, next question. How do I create more lift in the shoulders at the canter? This question is from Heidi Clark. Okay, more lift in the shoulders at the canter. The biggest secret that I say all the time, you want to half haul in the canter when the mane is flying up because that is when the front feet are off the ground. It's really important that you half halt at that moment so that you create more lift in the shoulders. Another really good exercise to create more lift in the shoulders in the canter is transitions. So trot, canter, trot transitions, walk, canter, walk transitions. That's going to really help to get your horse to engage their hind end and lift in the shoulders if you do your transitions correctly. But transitions are everything. Like seriously, training happens in the transitions. So Next question is from Dawn. How do you count and coordinate your aids for the tempi changes, especially the twos? I think I have a YouTube video somewhere about this, but basically when you're counting the tempi changes, you always count one less than you're doing. So for example, if I am doing four tempies, I count to three. So I go one, two, three, eight, two, two, three, eight, three, two, three, eight. That's the aids for four tempies. For three tempies, you count to two. So it's going to be one, two, eight, one, two, eight. For two tempies, you only count to one. So it's basically one and one, eight, one, eight, one, eight. And it does come fast. Like as you go from fours to threes to twos, it gets faster and faster. 
when you do your one tempies, you basically have to aid before the horse does the change. So the aids for the one tempies are basically just aid, 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 aid. So hopefully that helps you, Don. Um, if you look on my YouTube channel and Google like my name and Tempe changes, I have a video where I go through it on a horse and that might also help you. For all of you guys watching, pretty much whatever question you have, just go on YouTube, type my name in and whatever question you're having. And hopefully I have a video. If I don't, then um, send me an email and I'll add it to the list of videos to make for you guys. All right, next question. Um, let's see, wondering, oh, this is a good question from Natalie. Hi, Amelia, just wondering, do you always wear spurs? Would you use them on your advanced horses? That seems that seems so responsive to your leg aids. Okay, this is a really kind of like interesting question. And here's the thing is that when you're showing the FEI, you're required to wear spurs. So like at pre-St. George and above, you have to wear spurs. I actually got eliminated one time because I was riding this little Arab and he got really, really hot in the warm up. And so I thought, oh, I'm just going to take off my spurs because when I would like touch him with my leg, he would get kind of too sensitive. So I took off my spurs. The judge let me finish my test. At the end of the test, she rang the bell and she was like, sorry, I have to eliminate you because you don't have spurs. So I'm not really sure why this is because dressage is supposed to be all about like harmony and lightness. So wouldn't it be like the true test of lightness that you could do the Grand Prix without any spurs? But I think that the reason that they require you to have spurs is because it shows like acceptance of the aids, acceptance of the leg. So to answer your question, I would say I ride with spurs most of the time, but not all of the time, because it is good to practice sometimes not riding with spurs. There's also like lots of different kinds of spurs. So usually when I'm riding like on a daily basis, I have like these little tiny spurs, like they're probably a quarter of an inch long and they're very small. Um, and they're kind of like blunt on the end. So they're like basically as small and subtle of a spur as you can possibly use. Um, then from there you can go like to a longer spur or to a sharper spur, which sometimes I will use like a different type of spur depending on like if I'm at a show and I know my horse is kind of a little bit on the lazier side, sometimes I will put a bigger spur on my horse. But again, like your spurs and your whip are an auxiliary aid. So it's really important how you use your spurs. Um, and I've been, I was reading this week, I'm getting ready for those of you guys that are part of the monthly workshops. This month's topic is about how to bond with your horse and how to have fun with your horse. And so we have a live Zoom lecture coming up. I do these lectures like every month for people that are part of the Academy monthly workshops. It's like such a fun group. But I've been reading this book it's called Horse Brain and Human Brain. Like I highly recommend this book. You can see all the sticky notes <laughs> that I've been doing. Um, because it really is fascinating when you really start to understand like how the horse's brain works, how it's different than our brain. And I think it helps you understand for one, how to train your horse and then also how to communicate a little bit better with your horse. So um, I don't want to give too much away, but I'm really looking forward to that lecture, which is going to be Let's see, next Wednesday and Sunday, because this weekend is Easter. Oh, Daffle says, I just got that book last week. It seems like everyone right now is reading this book. I've had it for a little while, but it is, it's really a fascinating book. Okay, next question. Let's see. Um, Dominique, my mare gets racy and tends to curl up and run through the downward transitions. What exercises can help us improve downward transitions? 
Okay, so for downward transitions, if the horse wants to curl, I would recommend putting it in a little shoulder in or like moving the horse a little bit off the inside leg and into the outside rein. That will help with the curling is inside leg, outside rein, shoulder in. As far as the horse getting racy, I think the most important thing is to think about your core, think about your seat, really like riding from your center. So pulling your belly button to your spine um, and kind of that your seat dictates the tempo that you want during the transition. That will really, really help a lot. And then just half halt release, half halt release, half halt release. And practice. <laughs> yeah, that's like dressage, right? Just practice and repetition. Like, okay, that wasn't great. We do it again. That wasn't great. We do it again. That's dressage for you. Okay, Diego, how to start training a green horse? Um, groundwork. <laughs> that's like my answer to almost everything. But for sure, when you have a green horse, is that you really, really want to teach them as much as possible from the ground. One, because it's really important that you stay safe. It's important that you don't have a bad experience and that the horse doesn't have a bad experience. And when done correctly, you can teach your horse the aids from the ground. So you can teach your horse like about the leg, about the rain. You can teach them a lot of stuff from the ground before you even get on them. And um, my, I have a whole course on groundwork, which we just did this, like the beginning of the year, we'll do it again at the end of the year. It's like one of my favorite courses ever, but groundwork has saved me so many times. When I was younger, <laughs> I feel like I'm getting old now. When I was younger, all I did was start young horses and deal with problem horses and groundwork is like the thing that saved me because I wouldn't say that I'm like particularly good at staying on a horse when they're bucking or spinning or doing crazy things. So I really focus on groundwork because that's what keeps you safe. And that's what allows you to teach your horse things before you get on them. Okay. Um, next question, Barbara. Oh, I think we answered that one last time. Okay. Haley, tips for you and your horse's first show. Walk, trot. Okay. That's a good one. So like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to do a webinar on show season and we do have some competition courses as well. But I think the most important thing, and I'll say this is from experience as well, because I had a horse, I took my horse Luigi to the show last weekend and it was his first show. Let me know in the comments if you guys are planning on showing this season. Yes or no. Let me know if it's your going to be your first show ever. But anyway, so I took Luigi to the show. It was his first show ever. So I said to myself, okay, it's really important since I don't really know what he's going to be like at the horse show. And I really want to have a good experience with him because if you have a bad experience with your horse at a horse show, then it like makes every show like you kind of have that anticipation that something's going to go wrong. So let's see, Christine showing, Shari showing, good for you guys. Um, since it was his first show, I spent a little extra time with him on the ground. And so my strategy with him was I got him all tacked up. I went and I took and I just led him around the arenas because I went a day early. So I really took my time, led him around the arenas, let him see everything. And then I did a quite a bit of lunging and groundwork, especially because like two weeks ago I got dumped and I got a concussion. Like I was not right for like a week. It was terrible. My head hurt. I felt like foggy. It was really bad. So the thing about when you get a concussion is that you're not supposed to get another concussion right away. And so here I am at the horse show with a horse that's never been to a horse show before thinking I really can't afford to fall off. So we did a lot of groundwork, a lot of walking around, 
Um, I honestly got him just a little bit tired before I got on him at the show and he was perfect. So no, I did not fall off of Luigi. I came off of a horse that I was rehabbing. Rehab is so dangerous. You guys like be careful when you're rehabbing. It's not worth getting hurt over. But anyways, so I just took extra time on the ground. I took extra time leading him around. The other thing that I think is important when you're showing that I do with myself and I also do with my clients is give yourself permission to scratch. And I totally did that with Luigi. I was like, okay, I I don't feel great. I've had a concussion. I have a six-year-old that's never been to a horse show before. But I already paid the entry fee and I was like, you know what? I'm going to take him. I'm going to see how he is. If it feels good, I'm going to show him. If it doesn't feel good, guess what? I'm going to scratch. And that's fine because I'm still going to learn a lot. So give yourself that permission at your first horse show that you can always scratch. You can get all dressed up, all ready to go warm your horse up. And you can always say, you know what? Like, I'm here. I'm ready. Today's not the day. And that's totally fine. And just giving yourself that permission to bail makes it so that you're like almost never going to bail. But just give yourself that permission. Give yourself that out because there's nothing wrong with that. Even if you go to the horse show and you get all ready and you lunge your horse and you do groundwork and you get on for five minutes and you realize like, I'm not quite ready to be here. Then you go home and you have so much more of an understanding of what you need to work on to get there. And then the other thing that I think is really important whenever you're showing is to remember that we're doing this for fun. Like we love our horses we're here to enjoy our horses. Of course, we want to do well. Of course, we want to get better. But like until you're riding down at the center line at the Olympics, it's all training. Like you're just here to have fun, to show off your horse, to learn something, to get better. I don't know if any of you guys watched the World Cup, but in the World Cup, in Germany last weekend, there was a rider in the freestyle, Charlotte Fry. She's like such an amazing rider. She seriously is like my favorite rider of all time. You guys all have to, when you get done with this tonight, Google Charlotte Fry on YouTube and watch her ride. Like her position is incredible. She's her seat, her hands, like she's the most amazing rider ever. I love watching her ride, but get this. So she goes down the center line for her freestyle. The stands are full. She's been working all year. She's shown this horse a lot. And he decides that he won't go in one of the corners. And he's like completely freaked out in the corner. And he spins around a few times. Meanwhile, her music is playing. And she's supposed to be doing certain movements based on her music. And she had to completely abandon her floor plan. She did like this extended trot to the other side of the arena and then managed to like on the fly, like rework her floor plan. She got almost everything in, but, you know, she didn't do that well. And normally she was getting like, I think, 80 percent. And she ended up the very last place with the 67 percent. So it happens to everyone. Like horses are unpredictable. And that's part of like, you just have to know that and know that you're going to put your best for, foot forward. You're going to do all your groundwork. You're going to train your horse at home. You're going to set it up for success as much as possible. But at the end of the day, bad things happen. And I think it's really important to always have empathy for anyone that's having a hard time with their horse. That's one thing that makes me so mad is when people like are critical or mean to someone that's having a hard time with their horse. Because if you've ridden, if you've been there, like you, the only, if you're a true horseman and you see someone having a hard time in the show arena, having a hard time with your horse, your heart should just melt for that person. And there should be no judgment whatsoever. I always say like, if you think that you can do better, then get on and do better. 
because riding is really hard and dealing with these horses is really hard. And that's just part of it. Like you're going to have days where you have these amazing rides and the feeling's incredible and everything goes well. And then you're going to have days where you get on and something scares your horse and you can't even go in one corner of the arena. And, you know, you feel like you should just quit and give up. And that's where like community is so important is that you have to have like as a community, we all need to support each other when we have a bad day, when our horse is lame, when we get a bad score, when we fall off, like it happens to all of us. And it's really, really important that we're here to lift each other up and to support each other when we have those things happen, because one day it's going to be you. And, and that's where we all need to be able to put it in perspective and know that it's normal. You're going to have like really good days. You're going to have really bad days and that's just fine. But anyways, that's my little soapbox. I got a little carried away, but yes, I love this community. Like someone posted on YouTube and it's just so important that you're never judgmental, never critical, always supportive, always encouraging, um, because that's horses. Okay. A few more questions. Um, this is a good one from Justina. What am I doing wrong when asking for Traver and my horse starts to canter? Okay. That's a good question because here's the thing is that the aids for Traver, Traver is haunches in, and the aids for canter are very similar because both of them have inside leg at the girth, outside leg behind the girth. The big difference between Traver in, in trot versus the canter aid is that a canter aid is more distinct. Like if I'm trotting and I'm going to ask my horse to canter, I'm going to think like trot, 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 half halt, half halt, close my leg, bop, canter. Um, I also, for the canner, when you ask for the canner aid, it's kind of like lifting the energy up and sending it straight forward. So even though for the canner aid, it's outside leg behind the girth, inside leg at the girth, when your outside leg goes back and you're asking for canner, your inside leg prevents the haunches from falling in. So it's kind of like the outside leg tells the lead and your inside leg gives the impulsion. Now, if you're going to ask for haunches in or traver, it's not such a distinct abrupt aid. It's kind of like you're melting into it from a circle or from a corner. So like usually when I set up for the traver, I do it at the end of a 10 meter circle. So I'll do a 10 meter circle. As I finish the 10 meter circle within the rhythm of the trot, I slide my outside leg back. I keep my inside leg at the girth. It's not as much of like a lifting, driving forward aid as much as it is more of a bending aid and um, the haunches going in. So it's something that you're going to have to experiment with. If if you're asking for a traver and your horse um, just canters on, then what I would do is I would kind of keep your legs there um, get the horse to go back to the trot and the second that they trot, then reward them, but kind of keep your legs there. You can also even go back to the walk and just put like teach your horse the traver at the walk. So anyways, that was a lot of questions. Um, thank you guys all so much. These Thursday night Q and A's are a lot of fun and I love hearing from you guys. I love your questions. Um, it's just, it's really special. It's so cool that I can help all of you guys all over the world that I don't even know. Be sure to check us out on Patreon. Um, and yeah, for those of you guys that are part of the, like either the monthly workshops or the, um, some of the courses that I've been doing, one thing that has been really, really cool is that people have been able to submit more videos and then we've been watching them on Zoom together. So I'm I'm starting to be able to like actually see you guys ride 
and then give you one-on-one -on -one feedback, which is really cool. And I also think that it's helping me to produce more content that's really going to help you guys. So the more that I get to know you, the more that I see your horses, the more that I answer your questions, the more I'm understanding where you guys are stuck, what you're struggling with, what level you're at. And so it's helping me to be able to give you the content that you guys really want, because at the end of the day, that's really what it's all about is me being able to use my knowledge and expertise and break it down in a way that you can understand. So anyways, I hope y'all have a wonderful evening and um, yeah, we'll see you next Thursday. So yeah, Tracy, you're a beginner dressage rider. Yes, one year. Good. Yeah, I love, I mean, I just think it's so cool. We're all kind of at a different place in our dressage training journey and that's awesome. We're never done learning in dressage. And as my husband says, in dressage, you can be frustrated for life. So <laughs> cheers to being frustrated for life. We will see you all next week.